Fifteen years after the initial release, Devil May Cry 3 is still considered one of the best, if not the absolute best, game in the genre. Regardless if you agree with that takeaway, it's impressive how Devil May Cry 3 still holds up well all these years later in comparison to its immediate successors like Devil May Cry 4, Ninja Gaiden 2, or Bayonetta. With that in mind, I feel like revisiting Devil May Cry 3 to get another opinion on it and see how well it fares with a fresher set of eyes. Fifteen years after the fact, in a post Devil May Cry 5 world, let's give a reevaluation on the third game in the series. To really start talking about Devil May Cry 3 and how it set the standard for the genre, we have to look back a little bit. Devil May Cry 1 basically invented the whole character action game type, so how exactly did 3 follow up and add to it? Well, it basically just took everything that that game did and dialed it up to 11, really embracing the whole more is more idea. The pause combos from the first game, where the three main combo strings were all done in sequence by pressing one button with different timing, were expanded on and refined. The weapon swapping trick you could do in one by throwing out the sword with round trip and then quickly changing to the Ifrit gauntlets, now that's a central mechanic, which you can pull off with any two weapons on the fly with ease. Only one boss fight is repeated and is heavily remixed each time, the style meter is more bombastic and telegraphed, Dante as a character has gone from cool, quiet confidence to loud and overtly cocky, and I could go on. The Devil May Cry sequel really went out of its way to take what people loved about the first game and expand on no, no no no, not you, never you. Okay, actually, well kinda you. Let's talk about this quickly. Devil May Cry 2 sucks. It's an awful game, an awful sequel, and no amount of retroactive defending of a genuinely terrible game or waifu posting about some nothing character like Lucia is going to change that. However, Devil May Cry 2 serves an important role for getting the series savior Hideaki Itsuno on board. Long story short, DMC2 went through development hell. And after the unnamed first director was gone from the project, Capcom pulled in Itsuno to try and salvage this mess within a four month time period. Naturally, Itsuno was pissed at all of this, and basically threatened to walk if he didn't get the chance to make a third Devil May Cry game entirely from his vision. Capcom fortunately agreed, and that's how Itsuno ended up saving Devil May Cry the first time a trash game killed it. With 3 being a prequel, in both story and gameplay it tries to erase 2 from existence, acting as the true sequel to Devil May Cry. Although, be fair, minor elements from DMC2 like aiming guns at multiple enemies and limited wall running both feature here. Let's get to the details about how DMC3 expands on the first game. The pause combos in 1 were a pretty brilliant way to expand the moveset of a weapon, in that game the sword weapon type, without having more buttons dedicated to strings. This returns basically unchanged in DMC3, but is added to with a new combo variant, where by mashing the final button in a combo string, you'll enter a rapid fire attack of sorts. It's basically a more versatile version of the million stab move from 1, but the real kicker to this, and the attacks overall, is that it isn't just limited to the sword moveset this time. Practically every Devil Arm, with the clear exception of Nevin, all operate with the expanded combos like the Rebellion Sword. Even Beowulf, the replacement for the Ifrit Gauntlets, didn't pull back this time and has a fairly large individual moves list that dwarfs the ladders. Really, the entire sword and kickboxing movesets from DMC1 is lifted and expanded upon its three with the Rebellion and Beowulf Devil Arms, and the game doesn't stop there. The Cerberus Nunchucks act as a rapid-fire DPS weapon with great potential for counters, the Twin Swords Agni and Rudra act as large, looping crowd control type of weapons, and Nevin is a bizarre action game take on a magic spellcasting sort of weapon. All five weapons have their ups, downs, and situational advantages, and each provides a great deal of variety for the player to mess around with. Adding on to the variety, the brand new style system completely overclocks the combat. The four core styles are all expanding on elements seen in Devil May Cry 1's combat system. The generous iframes found in the jumps and rolls, the focus on melee attacks above all else, having the guns become primary weapons with some devil trigger trickery, and the limited parry system with sword clashing. All these are expanded and streamlined into the primary styles. Trickster is a large, generous dodge slide, Swordmaster adds a larger melee move list to play around with, Gunslinger turns the usually supportive guns into viable offensive tools, 
and Royal Guard provides a kind of parry that becomes the game's best offensive option. The ultimate high risk, high reward playstyle. All add unique dimensions to the moment to moment combat, and the game is freeform enough to allow all four to be viable for most situations. All that is, except for the game's other two styles, Quicksilver and Doppelganger. Both work off of the Devil Trigger gauge rather than being a unique move of their own, and because of that, they're more of a hindrance than anything else. Devil Trigger adds a big damage buff and heals you at the same time, not to mention the new DT pop attack where you can charge Devil Trigger and have it pop off into a strong area of attack explosion. Needless to say, it's far more useful to have Devil Trigger on you than either of these two styles the vast majority of the time. Quicksilver can be situationally useful, don't misunderstand me, but Doppelganger really isn't worth much outside of that cute little co-op feature it adds. The biggest issue with styles just boils down to the level up. See, each of the four core styles has three tiers that it can reach. They all start off at level 1, and through the use of them in levels, the player can level them up to get new abilities with each new tier. This is on paper not a bad idea, rewarding the player for sticking to a style and practicing with it, but the issue comes down to the grind required to get one to level 3. Unless you only use a single style for every mission, it's extremely unlikely if not impossible to max out any of them by the time you see the credits roll. Which means it's time to use that fancy new level select option and start grinding these bad boys out. Grinding sucks in RPGs, and in fast-paced, high-skill action games like DMC3, it both sucks and sticks out like sore thumb. As mentioned earlier, weapon swapping was a trick that you could pull off in the first Devil May Cry, and 3 took this little secret and made it a core component of the gameplay. Swapping is effortless, with a single press of a trigger switching between two double arms or guns. You set your inventory before every level and by interacting with the item shop, so the game encourages you to play around with the different setups to see what works. Just for a couple of examples, pairing Rebellion and Cerberus together can make a great chain attack, switching off to the second after each hit. Pairing Nevin with any of the others can work as an interesting side weapon for ranged projectile attacks and area denial. Firing the strong, slower guns like Spiral or Clean Ann once, and quickly changing to Ebony and Ivory, then immediately back again to fire, can make a real fast chain for them. This is all just the surface level of the creative mixes that you can make too, and there are many combo videos that can attest to this. Hell, you can even do goofy tricks with the animation cancels, like flying with Nevin. The biggest drawback with how the menu options work is more than likely due to the PS2's memory limits. The player can only have one style, two devil arms, and two guns on their person at a time, and with how much DMC3 emphasizes player creativity and freedom within the combat, I don't think this is a deliberate development decision as much as it is a concession for the hardware limitations. Considering where the two successors went after this with style swapping and complete inventories, I'm pretty confident in that. Don't misunderstand, DMC3 is overflowing with options and play variety to sink your teeth into, but there is a reason later entries tried to streamline how all this worked. This has been a mostly glowing review so far, though one of DMC3's less than great aspects are, being frank, it's boss fights. This might be an unpopular opinion, since this game features some of the most praised bosses in any action game. Look, don't get me wrong, DMC3 has some fantastic fights in it, and one I'd consider a contender for the all-time greatest boss fights in a video game, but let's be honest here, there are just as many mediocre or a few outright bad bosses as there are good ones. It's a pretty mixed bag when you look at them all together. For every Virgil, Agni and Rudra, and Beowulf, there's a Gigapede, Leviathan's Heart, and this thing. This is an element of DMC1 that I actually think is stronger than the 3, as the boss roster in that game feels a lot tighter in comparison. While some might not be crazy about them simply due to DMC1 showing its age pretty hard, and repeating the four core bosses three times each is no doubt a sign of the game's lower budget and rush development, each one of them at the very least was used to teach and enforce the game's core mechanics. 
I actually did go over this all in a video all about DMC1 if you want to hear specifics, but the point is each one felt like a test of the player's grasp of how DMC1 played. The better bosses in Devil May Cry 3 are like this to some extent, but the game doesn't do this anywhere near as often as the first Devil May Cry. This is mostly due to the shift in design priorities between the games. The core principle of DMC1 was using a more limited tool set at your disposal to find the ideal solutions to challenges. DMC3, in contrast, was made with a more is more mindset. All three of Itsuno's games are focused on giving the player a shitload of options at their disposal at any given time, with each challenge having multiple viable and stylish solutions. Naturally, making a boss fight which provides a solid test on multiple different options and playstyles is significantly harder than making bosses which test out only a few possible options with one or two paths to victory. DMC3 does have some of these, however. My favorite example is Beowulf, a boss that can be defeated using all four styles pretty effectively, with little nuances thrown in to accommodate all of them. Some of his attacks can be used effectively in different ways. The upgraded Swordmaster can turn these projectiles back onto Beowulf by throwing Rebellion at them, or you can take the hit with Royal Guard to build up for the Royal Release attack, basically for free. At the end of the day, I don't think either choice of action game design is inherently better or worse than the other, from DMC1's limited tricks to DMC3's bevy of options. It's just that the bosses in 3 are a bit of a mixed bag, showing the growing pains of Itsuno's style. We've ragged on about them a bit too much, so back to gushing. After all, no mention of bosses would be complete without diving into Virgil. All three fights act as climaxes to the game's three acts, neat capstones which provide a cumulative test for everything the player could have learned up to that point. Virgil is by no means the first example of the rival character trope, but he sure as hell became the gold standard. Looks like the protagonist Dante, while still having numerous defining differences of his own, has matching abilities without being a mirror match, and even gets devil trigger and collects devil arms just like Dante does. Fighting him feels like the peak of each act, with Virgil 2 in particular probably being my favorite boss fight in the video game. It's a fast, frantic test of reaction time and pattern recognition, with the added pressure of introducing his devil trigger a third of the way through the fight. It's also a good example of storytelling through gameplay, with the boss showing Virgil's confidence break throughout the fight. At the beginning, he throws away his Japanese samurai sword in favor of brand new kickboxing gauntlets. He's arrogant and completely self-assured of his victory, but that starts to dissipate when Dante knocks him around some. Third way through the fight, he starts to talk trash, implying that Dante is inferior to him while pulling out his own devil trigger. Another third of the way through the fight, the trash talk is gone, and out of panic he reverts to the Yamato once more, doing everything possible to beat the opponent he completely underestimated. It's a great boss fight, highlighted by its narrative context and delivery. Story is one of those aspects that Devil May Cry 3 does well, which is honestly surprising. The Devil May Cry series has never been strong in the whole plot area. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light. Light, 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 light. It was basically nothing in one, very basic in four, and honestly a bit of a mess in five. What's held the real charm for the series has always been, even in the very first game, the cast of characters, which are always very charming and fun to see on screen. DMC3 is the standout in this regard though, as while it does have the strong cast of characters, the actual story itself has a bit more going on than you would expect. The game focuses on a small cast, and due to the short and sweet length of it, it takes the proper time needed to develop each of them. Obviously, they aren't the deepest characters in the world, I'm not trying to play it off as some genius masterwork of character writing or something, but all of them are well-rounded, clearly defined, and have interesting arcs presented well. First and foremost, DMC3 is a character story, and above all else, their arcs and interactions with each other are what really matters here. Through these arcs, DMC3 can deliver its core themes and takeaway ideas. Sure, there are very simple ones, like the importance of family, learning responsibility, and the damage of running from your issues and refusing to process them. However, the real strength lies in the execution. DMC3 is a coming of age story where our protagonist Dante must, well, come of age, and stop living his completely carefree life. This is a basic setup that plenty of famous stories follow, but what always stuck me about DMC3 was how, by the very end, 
Dante doesn't actually come of age. Over the course of the game, Dante goes through trials and tribulations, confronts his brother, and has his character tested, and by the final battle, he seemingly has overcome his own childish nature. But at the very end, he throws all that away and reverts back to the wacky Wahoo Pizza Man persona that he's been putting on since the game's very opening. It's an interesting, unconventional conclusion to this kind of story, and we'll get to why I think Dante does this. DMC3 is broken up into three acts, and each of the four cast members has three main parts of their arc corresponding to the acts. Act 1 introduces the character to the audience, and at least on the surface we learn who they are. Act 2 is when we start to see who the character really is under the surface, with their mask cracking a bit and their actions starting to show their true makeup. Act 3 is where we get a full view of the character, and said the character is given a choice to either confront the issues which caused them to embrace the mask in the first place, or keep running from them. All four choose the latter option to varying degrees of severity. Dante, Virgil, Lady, and Arkham all have their arcs fall to the same beats. However, the Lady and Arkham plotline is, more than anything else, a truncated version of the main conflict of the game, which is absolutely Dante and Virgil. These are the two whose interactions and arcs have the most weight of the cast and inform the game's core concepts the most directly. Dante and Virgil are the opposite sides of the same coin. While they look and act on the surface as complete opposites, the whole red oni, blue oni thing on full display, take away the style and presentation, they're both essentially emotionally stunted children at their core. Both never having grown up after a shared trauma and hiding behind the masks they adopted afterward. This makes sense, as even without knowing all the expanded universe material, the first Devil May Cry established that their mother was killed by demons when they were both very young, and their father wasn't an aspect of their early lives at all. Essentially, they were both left to fend for themselves when they were still kids, and when you throw in the fact that they are both basically invincible godlike super people, neither of them really had to grow up. Dante and Virgil never truly grew or matured, but both do express this arrested development differently, and their arcs show them tackle it in their own ways. Before getting to that though, it's worth looking back at the first Devil May Cry, as Dante and Virgil are both elements there. Dante being a more jaded professional demon pest control guy, and Virgil being enslaved by Mundus. So no matter what would happen, their fates would be sealed. DMC3 avoids this common prequel problem by having context given here which retroactively adds depth and makes their fates in the first game a lot more interesting. Dante in particular benefits here. In DMC1, Dante was soft-spoken, cool, and confident without being cocky or particularly in your face about it. Dude is just extremely laid back, hardly reacting to much and taking it all in stride until some of the game's later events. In DMC3, however, Dante is bombastic, loudmouthed, and arrogant. It's interesting to see the contrast between the two. Virgil essentially has no character in the first game, but in DMZ3 he's shown to be Dante's opposite. Cold, stoic, a man of few words. We're introduced to Dante in Act 1 essentially as a kid who's never grown up. He's slacking off, not even having named his shop, and already turning down business in favor of laying back and eating pizza. He only takes the initial call to action with a promise of excitement coming from the idea of fighting his brother again and styling on some demons. Here, Dante's behavior pretty much is entirely played for laughs, with him just goofing off while fighting demons. Virgil, on the other hand, is purely business in the first act. He doesn't speak often, but when he does speak, he's in complete control of every conversation he engages in. He's on top of everything going on, and is shown to be the true dominant force here, when he one-shots a boss that Dante couldn't kill moments beforehand. It's only after the first fight that they have that we start to see hints of their deeper characteristics. Virgil gives a small hint of what his true motivation is for the story, with him giving the whole might controls everything speech, and we'll get back to this later. Dante, for his part, drops the whole goofball routine and shows some genuine anger for Virgil, activating Devil Trigger for the first time and trying to get another round in. In spite of this, in Act 2 they both try to put their masks back on. Dante being a silly joker again, and Virgil being the emotionless warrior. Dante's immaturity is finally put in a negative light, however, when he walks in on Arkham's presumed dead body and jokes about killing him when asked by Lady. Dante in this scene is doing the exact same comic relief routine that he had done with most of the bosses prior. However, this time the game puts it in a different light. 
He comes across as insensitive, callous, self-centered, and entirely indifferent to other people, just laughing off another character's pain. All in all, he starts to look like an asshole. The scene ends without him having any quips for Lady, who simply just tells him to leave, dejected. Act 2's purpose is to show off the core aspects of our characters, and for Dante and Virgil, we see their contrasting immaturity start to rear its head. Dante is the more overt of the two, obviously. He's always acting like a clown, even while Lady's openly displaying her grief, most likely because that's how Dante always responded to grief. Both him and Virgil are putting on acts of some kind in response to their shared trauma. Dante's refusal to ever acknowledge the gravity of situations up until this point is just a maladaptive defense mechanism, saving him from having to confront emotional discomfort and uncomfortable situations. Virgil, on the other hand, starts off composed and cold in Act 2. However, after attempting to kill off Arkham and having his henchmen confront him with his human mother, we start to see his composure crack. He has no response to this and just petulantly tells Arkham to shut up and leaves him for dead. By the time Dante catches up with him in the second act's end, Virgil's composer is fully broken and he's just ranting and raving at this point about how his plan isn't immediately working. In essence, Virgil's throwing a temper tantrum before his brother shows up to fight. Like Dante, Virgil refuses to process grief of any kind through stonewalling it. He outright denies his human side, and in turn, his emotions beyond throwing tantrums after bottling everything up for so long. He rejects his mother's humanity, and instead fully embraces the demonic heritage of his father. The father that DMC1 implies he and Dante never actually knew. Instead, it's more likely that Virgil looked at his father as a stoic symbol of raw power, some kind of demonic apex predator no one was able to stand up to. Altogether, the exact thing Virgil wants to be. Why? Well, this brings us to the third act and Virgil's true motivation. Virgil's absent for most of Act 3, only appearing on screen again at the game's climax. After teaming up with Dante briefly for the fight with Arkham, Virgil's composure has eroded completely, and in the last encounter with Dante, we see his true face. Virgil rants and raves at his brother, flying off the handle, screeching in impotent rage, his immaturity on full display. Virgil establishes his entire motivation for trying to gain his father's ability and opening the portal to hell in the first place. Royal domination, godhood, nope, in his own words, I need more power. That's it. The question is, why does he need more power? Well, because once Virgil was entirely powerless, and because of that, his mother died and he lost his brother. His massive power loss stems from that one moment of vulnerability and his inability to save his family. While Virgil never actually brings her up, it's pretty clear through his actions that despite him going on and on about his father's Sparta, it was his mother that he held real affection for. His mask first cracks once Arkham brings her up, and after being defeated by Dante in the third and final fight, when given the ability to pick up his mother's amulet or his father's sword before traveling deeper into hell, he picks the former without word or hesitation. Doesn't say anything, he simply leaves the force edge and picks up the amulet. And how does his arc end? While he does lean even further into the mask of the all-powerful son of Sparta that he first put on, leaving the human world behind permanently to live in hell, we do see one bit of development for him. After being bested by Dante and the portal to hell begins to close, he without hesitation warns Dante of this. After their final clash of swords, which Dante instigated, he insists on his brother leaving because even after everything else and his own inability to move past his trauma response, he really does love his brother. And that just leaves us with Dante. After the second Virgil fight and all through the second act, we do see some significant changes in him. Dante is no longer as loud, self-assured, or silly anymore. He's quieter, starts listening to Lady without trying to goof off, and starts to be honest about things. He admits to not actually caring until he's finally seen someone suffer through a similar issue and, and begins to learn how reckless his mentality was. From here on out, he goes to set things right. 
Hell, he even stops making nearly as many jokes or wisecracks, and when he does, they're less goofy. He's more cynical and just sounds tired by everything at this point. Dante even lets Virgil do most of the talking in their final encounter, something he claims to hate earlier on. Unlike his brother, Dante seems to have moved beyond his mask by the game's end and begun to mature, you know, to come of age. This is, however, until the very last second. When he reunites with Lady, he sheds a tear, lying about it when asked. Rather than take this opportunity to open up to someone about how he truly feels after having lost his final family member that he knows of, he immediately reverts once the opportunity presents itself. He rejects his character arc and embraces the wacky comic relief routine he had done beforehand. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. Dante lost in the end, despite his arc to grow up. One of the dominant character traits Dante is shown to have, even back in Devil May Cry 1, is how strongly he values family. In 3, while it's not brought up very often, we can infer from him starting in the game wearing his mom's pendant openly, and how resigned he sounds by the game's end when he might have to kill Virgil. On top of that, even after it all, he does try to stop his brother from falling. Dante does genuinely love his brother, but at the end of the story, all that maturing and growth he went through didn't get him what he wanted. His brother back, his last family member back with him. By the end, Dante got nothing externally out of this, so from his perspective, why stick to that path? He got nothing out of it, so why not regress and act closer to how he did in the game's opening? Why be open and face his grief head on when that kind of honesty didn't save his brother? In the epilogue, we see where Dante is left after all is said and done. On paper, he's better off. His shop's finally open, fully furnished, he's taking calls, and has even decided on a name for the place. However, notice how many bottles of booze he has lying around the place? Drinking that often alone is not a healthy habit, and I highly doubt he's inviting Lady over to hang out with him. While at the end, Dante is better than where he was at the start of the game, he's still resorting to numerous unhealthy methods of coping. This recontextualizes how Dante acts in DMC1. The more quietly confident one isn't a Dante who's grown up and mellowed out. It's more that he's just a tired, worn out version of the Dante from this game. He's still hiding his true emotions most of the time behind a routine of acting like a goofball not phased by anything. It's just that his enthusiasm while doing so has died down. Ultimately, the take-home idea of Devil May Cry 3 is how you can never successfully hide from your problems for long. It's easy to ignore, repress, and deny what eats at you, but in the long run, the damage done will take its toll. Moving on and growing may be hard, but in the long run, it beats the alternative. And that wraps up looking back at Devil May Cry 3, which I had a blast going back to. The game is a total package for me. It's fun, balls to the wall action that can tell an interesting, if not exactly subtle, story. DMC3 is an all time great, the standard that all other games in the genre should be judged by.